So hello and uh, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, this is our last seminar of the CSR uh, blog end of year seminar series 2020, uh, CSR Whistleblowing and Human Rights, which has been organized by the Corporate Social Responsibility and Business Ethics blog, together with the Center for Financial and Corporate Integrity of Coventry University and the EU funded project Virtue. We have enjoyed a series of intellectually stimulating presentations uh, given by a terrific list of experts and focused on corporate responsible behaviors. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Don Carpenter from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Luca D'Ambrosio from Science Po in Paris that are here with us for having co-organized this seminar series with me. It was an honor to be here with you. A special thank you also to the members of the CSR uh, blogs team. Uh, they have been great and their constant support has significantly contributed to the success of the series. Thank you very much for taking part in an active way in our blog project. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the members of the audience that have followed us in this journey, participating with insightful questions and fostering a constructive discussion. Your presence has been the best recognition of the fact that we've done so far, uh, what we've done so far has been appreciated. It's time for now um, for me to introduce our guest speaker. It is with great pleasure and sincere honor that I present today uh, Professor Jeremy Gilbert, who is Professor of Human Rights Law at uh, the University of Roehampton. Jeremy is an expert in the areas of business human rights and international human rights law, and his research has uh, always been characterized by special focus on the rights of minorities and indigenous people. Over the course of his career, Jeremy has published 27 scientific articles, six chapters, and five books. His latest article uh, is entitled Indigenous People and uh, Litigation, Strategic Strategies for Legal Empowerment, and has been recently published by Oxford University Press and selected as the editor's choice for open access. Jeremy has served as a consultant for several international organizations, uh, including the United Nations, and in such a capacity, he has effortlessly supported indigenous people's rights all over the globe. Finally, Jeremy has led several research projects and has very recently obtained funding by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council for an innovative research entitled Guardians of the Rivers and the Future of Earth Law towards a new legal, ecological, and participatory model for environmental humanities. Uh, this pro uh, congratulations for this, and uh, this research project, I think, is due to start this month. Now, on a more uh, personal note, I would like just to say that I was lucky enough to have Jeremy as my academic mentor when I started my academic career at the University of London, East London. Uh, his precious uh, pieces of advice, uh, constant intellectual uh, stimulus, and uh, our friendly discussions have always been a great source of inspiration for me, and I really miss the time we had the opportunity to work uh, closely together. So today, Jeremy will offer a presentation uh, that is entitled uh, Silencing Human Rights and Environmental Defenders, Corporate Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation, which will be focused on the shameful and increasingly used corporate strategy of filing strategic lawsuits having the sole purpose of silencing human rights activists. So with extreme pleasure, I give now the floor to Jeremy. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for joining us. Okay, and um, good evening, everybody, and uh, good afternoon, good, eve, good morning for those of you that are quite far away. Uh, really delighted to be joining you on this uh, last webinar of this uh, fantastic series on whistleblowing and congratulations to the three of you to organize this because uh, there's actually not enough focus on whistleblowing usually. And also I have to say putting a CSR human rights and whistleblowing together is even more um, less heard of so well done on doing this uh, fantastic webinar series. I'm happy to join you maybe with a bit of a different angle. Um, I, before I'm going to talk about the topic for today, I should place a little bit uh, where I'm coming from and to build maybe on Dr. Grasso's uh, fantastic introduction to explain a little bit how I got to come across this kind of uh, litigation. So as um, Dr. Grasso said, I'm Professor of Human Rights Law and um, 
I'm take often I go to court to support indigenous peoples when they go to litigation, uh, but for very different issues. Usually it's not always to do with cooperation, rarely to do with CSR, but usually it's likely to get a lit litigation against the government. But often what I've realized when we take, when we support litigation, behind the government there's often big corporation interests. And those corporations can have a massive impact on putting pressure on people taking legal action. So this is why I came really across this idea of uh, trying to silence people that are trying to take litigation to protect their human rights by cooperation in the context of indigenous peoples and their access to natural resources. Uh, I will give you more example uh, during the presentation, but just maybe to place that the fact that I'm not involved in any litigation on SLAP at the moment. Uh, I'm not speaking on any law firm or any clients. I'm just sharing with you some of the ideas uh, that I have on this idea of uh, litigation against people that basically are trying to protect their human rights or protect the environment. Um, I would say there might be a little bit less on CSR tonight and a bit more on human rights, but this is due to uh, my training because I'm a human rights lawyer. But I, I'd be mindful as well in the question to really uh, try to make the link between CSR and human rights law. Um, and I, I hope at the end of the conversation we can uh, maybe talk more about this. So I hope it makes sense in terms of where I'm coming from. Um, maybe one word on the title. So you can see the long title, uh, and sorry for this, I try to make shorter title usually, but uh, SLAP itself is a long name. I'm going to spend a bit of time maybe with you to go through uh, what is SLAP, what we mean by a strategic lawsuit against public participation. But also, um, I'm not doing SLAP in general, because you know, in terms of whistleblower, we could have spent more time on this. I'm really going to uh, narrow it down to the human rights and environmental defenders. So I'm also going to spend a bit of time uh, explaining why I'm doing this uh, focus. So let me move to the next slides. And this is a bit what we're going to do. So we have only 30 minutes, but that should be enough for us to, uh, to really look at some of those key elements and then we can have a discussion. So uh, I'm going to spend maybe five minutes on what is SLAP and uh, why it became such a, a well-known acronym in terms of uh, human rights defenders. Then I will explain a little bit what I mean by the human rights and environmental defenders and why I think the corporation are more and more targeting them. Then we're going to zoom a little bit into a case study in Thailand. Uh, and I will explain why we get, we're going to Thailand. And then I will talk a little bit more about uh, what has happened to the press and the media in Europe. But the main thing when uh, I've done this, if you want this is to set the, the tone and explain a bit the scenery. The main question I'd like to explore with you, and I don't have the answer, is uh, what can we do about it? Uh, SLAP is something that has really grown massively, but there's a bit of a legal loophole Meaning what we mean by legal loophole, it's, there's no legal framework really to address SLAP and to approach it. So as I said, I won't have the answer, but I'm gonna to try to give you a few ideas coming from human rights law. Or can we protect people against SLAP by using human rights, but also share with you some of the more recent initiatives by the Council of Europe. And I will explain why um, that might be important, not only in Europe, but actually across the globe. Okay, so that's, if you want the menu, for the talk. Uh, hope that makes sense. And again, I'll be happy to uh, take questions and uh, also why some of the elements I'm not talking about in the in the Q&A. But let's see, let's just start with um, the basic, which is what is SLAP. Uh, as I said, it has become a, a well-known acronym, sadly. Um, you might have seen it in the news. Uh, I'm usually someone that is real. Try to avoid acronym, but is it a long name? So it's, I'm gonna use SLAP, but really we need to Bear in mind, all the words are very important. It's a strategic lawsuit against public participation. And I think that's something really to bear in mind. It's, it's strategic, it's using law, and it's against public participation, which is strange to do you know, litigation. Usually, this is not the goal of litigation. It wasn't really put together. You know, it's not that it's new. Um, you know, if you want to stop someone, you're basically going to do that. You're going to try strategically to stop them. Uh, but the term was itself put in a book in, 19, in the 1990s, in 96. I put the reference there if you are interested to read, because uh, sadly it's an interesting read in the sense that uh, nothing has really changed over the last 30 years. It's actually gone worse. So SLAP was, uh, at the time, was put as a sort of uh, academic term to catch all those kind of litigation that are really trying to silence public participation. 
But since then, what we saw, it's a massive increase. Basically, that's so, so big that uh, that little book became a sort of a leading world across uh, the world. Um, and that's been used since then in nearly all the jurisdiction uh, that, uh, yeah, I would say as well, civil and common law is the same. Uh, slap actually across the borders. So it has become a real global phenomenon. It refers to a, a legal action against, it could be an individual, but also civil society. And we're going to talk about this, even the media sometimes. Whenever they raise their public voice on something of social significance. So the case itself, it will be two attacks. This is the connection with public participation and probably the, the connection with uh, the overall thematic of the webinar, which is on whistleblowing. It's basically taking litigation against the whistleblowers. In that case, often they are the human rights activists or they are the victim themselves, but they start to raise an issue which is actually bigger than their own problem. Um, what I mean by this, some human rights victim, they will of course try to, to have litigation and remedies, but at the same time, when they do that, they want to put the finger on something that is of social interest for the rest of the world, not only for their own personal case. And that's why we can qualify them as a whistleblower if you want. SLAP is the reaction to this, is when one of those individual or a civil society organization, often they are human rights NGOs, will start to make noise around this, then the corporation will start to take litigation against those people. It involves all sorts of criminal of, uh, litigation. It could be civil law. It's often civil law based on defamation cases. But uh, as we're going to speak about it when we look at Thailand, it could also be criminal law, which is much more severe, meaning that you can actually end up with a, a jail term. And what people have been saying, it's actually a real judicial harassment. It's a way to put people under so much legal pressure that they will have to give up their public campaign on public participation and try to basically blow the, beat, the whistle and give up their whistleblower role because they will be facing criminal charges for defamation. That's probably what is the problem with this. And that's why it's really labeled as against public participation, because the goal is to curtail the voices of people that are trying to speak out on one issue by using defamation law or criminal proceeding to stop them. The thing which is striking, it's actually, you know, if you and me go to court, usually we go to court because we want to win. But in that case, it's not the goal. What has been clear is that the corporations often are using SLAP not even to win. They know they're not going to win. The goal is itself to derail the process of those NGOs or those individuals making noise on what is happening on the ground. Um, I put a quote there. For, uh, uh, you can see my last uh, at, the, at the bottom of the slide. So there's a, there's a nice um, little quotation from a, a recent report from those two people that were looking at cases in Europe. The SLAP does not need to be successful in court to have its intended effects. I think maybe take time to think about what it means, which is strange for, you know, as I said, in litigation, really, you actually want to win. Here, corporations don't really want to win. They just want to derail the process and just to take the, the real issue from the public partnership participation to something different. And that in itself is a strategy to make sure that what was at the start, the whistle blowing, effect is gone because there will be a defamation case that will basically take the attention away from what is the real problem. So that's why we use the term strategy because it, it's a real legal strategy to make sure that whatever is coming through the whistleblowing channel will be suddenly disappearing from the real issue because suddenly it will be a case of defamation or it will be a case of criminal lawsuit against that people. So that's why um, SLAP has become sort of a notorious for terrible reason. Because if we put all those cases together, we start to realize that it's a real tactic. And what I mean by tactic, and this is why I'm getting a bit more into the detail on that slide, you can see there's, a, there's many ways corporation might use litigation as a way to uh, derail a bit the process, which is, um, Okay, sorry, I was just looking at the chat, yeah, the question after. <laughs> uh, so Slack could be used in a way to, uh, often there's a financial aspect to it. Um, we have to bear in mind that usually a human rights advocate or people that are victim of human rights violation are people that have not a lot of means in terms of going to court. 
uh, they won't be able to have, you know, the really expensive lawyers that can spend really a long time on the cases. By using defamation cases or taking a different channel going to another court, what you do as well, you're going to exhaust the resources of those people. They won't even have any more the time, the energy to carry on their human rights campaign or to carry on what they were doing in terms of whistleblowing. Often what corporation will do is to open so many cases, we have individuals that have 14 cases against them because they dare to open the mouth. What happens there is you have to fight back those cases, of course, because otherwise you know, you're facing proper civil action, but also sometimes criminal cases. By doing this, they drive the resources from the human rights campaign or the environmental campaign, because then you have to fight the other litigation. So that's a way as well to really having a strategy to make sure that the whistleblowing element at the start will be basically disappearing under this. Also, what has been done is to not only open a lot of cases, even though your corporation know that those cases usually won't lead anywhere, but you know, um, I guess you're all familiar with the way litigation starts. It's a slow process. So whenever a case is open, it will take a year or two before actually the cases drop, even though there's nothing against the person. And that in itself drives resources, but also drives times and makes the campaign that was the start of the human rights uh, whistleblower to basically disappear behind this. Also, what corporation have been really good is to use multiple sort of injunction or different procedural system that themselves are very expensive. Again, just to drive the resources of the other party, which is basically the whistleblowers. Um, the other technique is to uh, systematically appeal any sort of decision. Just again, to uh, make the process even longer. If you appeal any decision, you know that is gonna go up the ladder of the legal system. And again, this is making sure that time clicks by and then the campaign itself disappear at the background, in the background. Also, what has been a common tactic is to uh, file cases quite far away from where the people might be living. Um, often those cases might happen in capital city, when actually the whistleblower or the human rights NGO will be quite far away in a more remote place. And the fact that you, the company will force those people to travel to the capital city to attend the hearings itself is a tactic to make sure that they are drying out the capacity of these people to maintain the campaign against the corporation. So this is, uh, and that's, that's the last part of my slide, it's a bit more technical, but maybe some of the lawyers in the room might know this uh, notion of the forum convenience. It's a, it's a fancy term by lawyers used to see when you can basically start to uh, decide, it's a bit like a shopping, you can decide which, which part of the court you want to go to. So, you know, you can go to criminal court, tort cases, you can decide to go to a different sort of litigation. This is what um, the tactic be used by corporation could be, they can do a bit of this shopping where they, go, they decide different type of court cases in different places, but also in different countries. I'm gonna give you, at the moment it's quite theoretical, but we're gonna move to example. But what I mean by this, it's uh, when a small community will take a legal action against a corporation, which is usually a subsidiary of a much larger multinational corporation, that multinational corporation might have the power to take litigation, not only in the country where the things are happening, but also where they are located, where they have their assets. So that means they can actually open a few litigation in different countries at the same time. And this is going to be extremely expensive and difficult for the people, the local people to fight because suddenly they might have to face a case, let's say in the UK, when actually the, the violation of their right or what they were reporting on was happening in Nigeria. Or the same, if you imagine a case, um, to talk maybe about experience, a case that might involve big oil company, then you suddenly end up having those litigation going against you across the world. So it's, it's basically, this is what we, this is what I mean by tactics. I could go on because there's so many different tactics and uh, every new case will bring all sorts of new strategy to use it. But it was just to uh, make you think about that first word, the strategy in SLAP. It's, it's a proper strategy rather than a proper way of going to court. Uh, sorry, let me pause. I'll just see uh, the chat going a bit. Okay. Uh, I'll see the question on the chat. I will come back to you after. Is that okay? Because um, now what I want to 
to set the scene as well. So I've been talking about what is SLAP, what we mean by strategic. Um, let me talk a bit more about what we mean by uh, human rights defenders and um, why I think they could be like whistleblowers. Human rights defenders have become more of a term in the last 20 years where it's basically anyone that acts not only for themselves, but also to make sure that their human rights and the human rights of others are protected. The connection with the corporation and some of the cases we're going to talk about is really about the fact that often it's to report on the situation of the workers. What has been more and more linked is the connection between the human rights defenders, people that take action or want to uh, use the whistle basically against corporation when there are violation of workers' rights are often connected with also environmental degradation. Why? Because the threats often to communities come from uh, more and more of the mining projects, the oil, the gas development, but also all form of um, this race, uh, the race for whatever natural resources which are left have led more and more of this kind of aggressive uh, approach by corporation to make sure that they can get access to the land without the local community to get involved. This is just to say, this is why I got into a uh, aware of this slap when I was supporting local communities on their right to lands and natural resources in those places. This is when suddenly you face a much larger battle when you realize that it's connected with business interests in those areas and then suddenly you are joining with big multinational corporation and not anymore the small scale sort of mining company or logging company that could be on the land. This is those big corporations that will have the means and the capacity to start those big um, slap litigation against the people trying to defend their lands. I put some figures there. This is from a, what I put in the bracket is the uh, Business and Human Rights uh, Resource Center, which is a fantastic institution which I invite you to look at. They basically collect all sorts of business, business related and human rights uh, cases across the globe. And they've been trying to really monitor this uh, aspect of SLAP. And you can see the number between 2015 and 2020, 40% of the 2,400 business link attack against human rights defender actually involved judicial using litigation. What they've realized it's more and more SLAP is becoming the norm. Whenever there's a human rights issue or environmental issues raised against corporation, SLAP will be the straight answer. It has become a sort of a de facto reaction by corporation to just protect themselves, even before they engage with what could be the human rights issue or the environmental damage. SLAP becomes straight away a way to try to stop the system, to even look at what are the problems with both human rights and the environment. As I said, so far it's been quite theoretical. So I'm going to zoom into uh, some of the cases in Thailand. Um, I should say, I've got nothing against Thailand. It's not speaking on a specific country. We could apply this to many countries. It just happened that Thailand was in the news quite a lot recently for those cases of SLAP because some very um, activate, uh, like brave people basically in Thailand started to take proper um, cases about workers' rights in Thailand. And there was a knock on effect in the reaction of the legal system that make made Thailand sort of a good case study on SLAP, but I should say many other countries are facing similar issues. If we could talk about the Philippines, uh, there's also SLAP cases, you know, in, uh, in the US, for example. So just to say that I'm using Thailand for the fact that it's been a very activist society that's been to trying to react against SLAP, but also because the legal system itself has been really damaging in terms of the whistleblower trying to bring uh, action. Why? Because as you can see from my slides, most countries, all the countries in the world will have defamation laws, but what's specific about Thailand, they have a criminal law on defamation, which, and you can see uh, what I said there from the Human Rights Lawyers Association, which is one of the main NGO in Thailand who are trying to protect human rights in the country. If we take just in the last few years, there was 312 uh, slap cases and 196 of them were actually under criminal law. Go back to what I said earlier, criminal law means that people are going to face going to jail for the fact that they started a case against a corporation because of violation of their human rights. So this is all bad it could get to by um, uh, not only curtailing the litigation, but also putting in danger the people themselves that were the victim to eventually become criminalized for defamation. To give a bit more perspective, uh, I'm going to zoom into one specific case, but as I said, there's, uh, there's a lot of cases out there and I will give you some reference at the end of this talk. 
Maybe I'm picking this one because I think some of the audience might be based in the UK and you might have heard in the newspaper uh, from this person, Andy Hall, is a British human rights activist that uh, in 2013 was involved in writing a report called Cheap as Heights, Cheap as a High Price, sorry. And that was a report um, that was commissioned by an NGO based in, it's called fin, Finwatch, which is based in Finland. But uh, the connection was this company, this uh, NGO, sorry, was trying to figure out the connection in terms of the supply chain between a lot of the agricultural produce that come to Europe and make sure that there's no slavery involved, there's no abuse of workers' rights, and also no damages uh, done uh, in terms of uh, the rights of the migrants. So that report was trying to basically look at the industry in general, but one of the company really took it badly in the sense that they started the slap litigation. That company is a uh, concern uh, pineapple. So it's the Thai pineapple processing plant, which is called, it's a natural fruit company called. And they targeting then the person that was part of this report, so on the all, and started the case of defamation on some of the law I was talking about, the criminal defamation. That case started nearly at the same time that the report came out. And in 2016, uh, Andy Hall was then found guilty under uh, the criminal code for defamation and was given a, a suspended three years prison sentence. Last year, that was actually dropped by the court. So it went all the way on appeal. And then the court realized, no, that actually it wasn't the defamation. It was based on proper fact and report from the migrants workers themselves that were facing for real human rights violation. But 2013, a report comes which is really damaging to some of those companies. The whole thing is kind of gone away because suddenly it's all about defamation cases. That's totally undermined what was the whistleblowing sort of reports because suddenly it becomes a criminal case against a British activist. So that creates all sorts of diplomatic rules. Then it's only in 2019 that the cases drop. What I mean by this, you can imagine 2013 to 2019, what they managed to do is to undermine the reality which was you know, blowing the whistle on something which is happening in the farm where there's actually an exploit of the migrant workers uh, in those farms and the fact that the supply chain when it comes to Europe, they should be aware that when they buy those pineapple, there's actually a problem in terms of the human rights of the workers. So you see the link between the human rights uh, whistleblowing and those uh, slap litigation. And, but this is just, that case in a way is a bit high level, uh, from the sense of the British, uh, maybe press, but it was not one usual, unusual case. There's been so many cases in Thailand at the same time. Connected to this, I'm just going to zoom to another one to give you another example. It concerns um, a chicken farm. Again, all this is as roughly at the same time when uh, in Thailand there was a big campaign by many human rights NGOs to really raise, to blow the whistle again on the fact that there were so many migrants being. Uh, coming to Thailand and they were totally exploited. There was no respect in terms of minimum pay. They were working more than 20 hours a day. Uh, they, were, they couldn't really leave those uh, facilities because their passports were taken away and they were under massive control. So the, the situation was borderline to a you know, counterpart form of slavery and exploitation of workers' rights. On the back of this, there was a complaint filed to the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, that's alleged that some of the migrant workers at the farm were forced to work up to 20 hours a day. They were paid less than the minimum wages and their, their identity document was confiscate, confiscated. That triggered a reaction because the Department of Labor and Protection of Welfare ordered actually that company to pay compensation for the damages done to the workers. So that was, it felt like a good process where, you know, the whistle was blown the National Commission react, reacted and the Department of uh, Labor itself told the company, you need to pay, you know, proper uh, aid to pay the worker, but also you need to pay compensation. But at the same time, what the company does, it starts 39 cases uh, of both criminal and civil complaint against most of the migrant workers that gave the, they were witness, basically they gave their statements to make uh, to the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, but they also started cases against the journalists that reported the case and then on the human rights NGOs themselves that supported the migrant workers. So um, 14 of the migrant workers that were concerned suddenly had a criminal case against them. Uh, even the National Human Rights Commission, you know, which is an independent watchdog from the government uh, that is monitoring every human rights um, event in the country, 
was also targeted to the extent that one of the national commissioners was also having a case of defamation against her. And also the journalists that were covering uh, had many cases open against them. Uh, there's more detail on the slide I let you read because I'm realizing that uh, time is going fast and I, I have a few more things I want to share with you. But please read that case because it, it's quite striking and it shows you what I was describing earlier about this idea of feeling so many cases that you can't even talk about the real thing, which is the human rights issue of the migrant workers in those farms were totally erased because suddenly it became defamation cases, criminal cases, protecting the freedom of press. So they did manage to diffuse what was really the main problem. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I, I, um, I realize I don't have that many time left, but uh, I don't want, I just want to raise also the fact that the media and the journalists also can become a target in those human rights cases when they start to report themselves on those human rights cases. An example comes from um, Vincent Bolloré, so he's a French, uh, very successful French businessman that has done a lot of uh, business in many um, countries across Africa. And he started uh, to open a lot of lawsuits about mainly, I don't know, there was three newspapers and I can see there are two NGOs for defamation, just because those newspapers and the NGOs were starting to report on the condition of work and the exploitation of the natural resources in those, um, it, it, this time it concerned logging and the uh, forest rights in the central Africa, in the in central region of Africa. Just the fact that they were reporting on what was happening between the connection between the holding company and the subsidiary in Cameroon itself was used to silence the journalists that were reporting on human rights because they felt like they need to curtail this otherwise readers in the western world might realize what was happening in uh, by some of the companies based in africa um, there's actually many more cases in europe and uh, at the moment going on the, the way journalists have been facing all this sort of uh, slap litigation whenever they dare to report on human rights on environmental issues to the extent that it leaves this is all we got to the question, but what can, what can we do in terms of the law? Is there something that can slap, stop slap to undermine the fact that human rights activists, but also now journalists can't even report on those cases? So this is really the question I um, don't have the answer to, but I like to discuss it. What can be done about this? Because, you know, harassment and we want, we want protection against defamation, clearly. This is not something I'm not trying to advocate against that. This is really important to be able to protect yourself against some crazy people saying things about you. But the problem it's being used in a way that means that we can't even anymore talk about um, or report on human rights issue. What we're facing is an interpretation of freedom. So our right is the right to freedom of expression. We should have the right to say whatever is relevant, but also relevant in terms of society. But it's true that the state has a right also to protect us for, for exploiting this freedom of expression. So the protection and the right of freedom are also important. So this is where there's been a debate on where is freedom of expression important? Is it to protect people that make claim on human rights? Or is it because we need also to be mindful that the states can at some time allow those corporations to challenge this. So there's a fine line there, but in a way what is not really relevant, it's a human rights law as a fundamental problem, which is it's mainly addressing the relation between citizen and the government. The corporation in a way are a bit invisible in that relationship. So when we say freedom of expression, we see that the state has to protect our freedom of expression, but it's a bit less understanding on to what extent as the corporation has an obligation to respect our freedom of expression. It is starting to develop, and this is what uh, General Steve Costa, uh, when we started, said, I am an expert on business and human rights. I wouldn't go as far as that, but this is, for those of you that have been following, business and human rights is a bit of a new, real challenge to the way we see human rights law. Because what is the problem is, um, under human rights law in, and the tradition of human rights law, the way we understand, it's about our vertical relationship. It's us citizen and we have rights from the government. This has been the tradition of seeing human rights law. And if you see all the international treaties are always framed in the way government and states have an obligation to protect our rights and to make sure that our rights, our freedom of expression is respected. 
it was until very recently the way for corporations say, well, human rights is not my business. This is for the states to deal with, not me as a corporation. This is where everything has really changed in the last few years. Uh, and I don't know how much you talked about this in the webinar already, but the UN and many states are starting to work at the moment on making sure that no, it has to trickle down. Corporations also have some obligation to make sure that they respect our human rights. At the moment, there's a big negotiation happening um, as we speak. It has been ongoing for the last 10 years to have a treaty on business and human rights. I'm not sure we will see the light of uh, anything positive um, in the next you know, few months, but it's, it's a process which is important because it has potentially an impact on what we're talking about. If suddenly we say cooperation, if they violate the human rights of individual can face the legal consequences, that totally changed that relationship that the corporation was hiding behind the state, saying, it's not me, you can't apply human rights against me because I'm a corporation, I don't, I'm not in charge of human rights, it's the government. So this whole guiding uh, principle of business and human rights are trying to reshape this, saying, okay, maybe states have the uh, obligation to make sure that they protect our human rights, but corporation, there's an obligation to carry human rights due diligence. And this is why it's connected a bit more to CSR and some of the corporate social responsibility that you might have talked about in the last few weeks. We're trying to join the dots by saying, corporation, even though for sure you haven't ratified those treaties, you're not the one that are under the obligation under those human rights treaties, you have an obligation of due diligence towards the protection of the human rights of all the citizens wherever you operate. Will it lead somewhere? It's hard to say at the moment. Uh, what the working group on business and human rights, which is the very proactive group that support this process of pushing more human rights principle to be applicable to the corporation, has developed some plan of action for the government. And one of them is the guidance on national action plan on business and human rights, which going back to Thailand, Thailand is one of the countries that actually put one of those national action plan in, in place in 2019. What and this is why I'm going to join my topic. What has been important in those national action plan? There is a call, a direct call to actually for states to put anti-slap legislation. So it's not even saying we should protect freedom of expression, it's telling the states it's your obligation to protect human rights to put anti-slap legislation into your framework. This is quite recent, it's only in the last year. So this is a bit where we are at the moment, but things are moving a bit faster. And I'm going to move more into a uh, Another area, which is not so much the human rights scene, but anti-slap legislation has started to uh, pick up a bit of space. It's really started in the US and then in Canada and, um, and in Australia. There's actually a, a piece on the CSR uh, blog on the, one of the legislation adopted in Ontario. Why does it matter? Because we can't only rely on human rights law. We actually need anti-slap legislation that are very clear that corporation cannot engage into this to the extent that we're losing those five years or six years of when we blow the whistle and then basically it's all about uh, going to court. So what I'm saying is basically human rights law itself won't be enough to ensure freedom of expression. We actually need that to intervene and to make sure that there's a, a fine line. We still want to protect, you know, to protect absolutely freedom of expression, but also defamation cases when it's abuse of, of uh, freedom of expression. <coughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> but at the same time, we want to make sure that there is not an abuse of the system by the corporation. So this idea of having anti-slap laws is starting to gather momentum, but it's not at the federal level. And that's why also I pick US, Canada and Australia. These were basically put forward by brave, I would say, or more creative states in those federal states that had the vision that, okay, they need to intervene at that level. It's not going to work on its own because if you think about what I said earlier, those corporations can always move. You know, and I said they can do the shopping in the way they go into litigation. So we could imagine, for example, if the corporation doesn't want to take you know, a slap litigation in Ontario, they just have to go next door. They go to Quebec or they go to another of the province in Canada and they might be able to do that. So having those slap legislation just as a state level, not federal, is never gonna be extremely satisfying because it will still allow the corporation to do the shopping they want and move the litigation somewhere else. 
So what we really need, and the initiative this time come from Europe, is a joint action between states to adopt all together anti-slap so that the, the corporation cannot move from one state to another. In Europe, that has been coming from some of the, the MEPs, so the members of the European parliaments, that have started to uh, join together. And uh, I put the name there because it's quite important to see who is involved. They actually send a letter to the European Commission saying that it's the EU itself needs to intervene and to regulate it. Why do we need something at the EU level? Because um, you might, for example, if I go back to my case that I mentioned, Bolloré and the case in Africa, it took litigation in Luxembourg, despite the, some of the company being based in France, and the problem was actually happening in Cameroon. But the fact that it could move between France and Luxembourg with no problem be based on just taxation issues and take litigation against the people that were reporting on in based in Cameroon and then in France was you know, problematic for these people. But now with a EU response that will avoid this, you cannot anymore move around the countries. There will be a EU joint um, response to this. At, on the back of the EU as well, the Council of Europe, which is another regional body of, you know, in, in, the, in that region, is also moving forward with this time the Commissioner for Human Rights that has proposed an approach to deal with it. And what I like about this approach is actually much more specific. Uh, and I think it will explain why I think it's important to have anti-slap legislation as such. The idea is that we need to prevent it. So, um, you know, I said, we can't stop defamation cases. That would be, you know, even that would be a problem in itself, it would be a violation of human rights. But the idea is that you could very early on dismiss the case. If the judge just see quickly, this, this is not funding or anything, it's just this corporation trying to basically make some noise. If instead of having to wait, you know, the proper judgment and two years, they could straight away just drop it and say, Sorry, you find the case against those people for defamation, but actually there's nothing real about this. I, the judge, decide to drop it straight away, end of the story. Also, there should be an introduction of punishments. If a corporation does that, then they will have to pay something if they just use the legal system to basically make the system itself to be a busy body. Uh, there's something to be said about our own you know, as citizen, we pay for the legal system, you know, as a paying taxation for the system to work. In a way, when the corporation are using SLAP just to waste time and money, they're actually paying, you know, wasting out money as well, the, the, the taxpayers' money by abusing the legal system. So it wouldn't be a bad idea that there might be a legal punishment for doing this abuse of the legal system, at least something that will pay back for the damage done. Uh, but also the idea in that proposal is to minimize the consequences of SLAP by giving practical support to those who are sued. So like that itself, the government could interpret say, no, but you've been attacked under SLAP and we're going to provide you, here, here are the NGOs or the lawyers that are specialized to protect you. Because something I, sorry, I should have said, which is very difficult for um, people that are using the, the whistle in terms of human rights or environmental law, they don't have the knowledge on this very specific uh, part of the law, which is defamation, uh, liberal, and uh, all these uh, cases that SLAP integrates. So usually they have to rely on other lawyers. That's itself as a cause. So here what the idea would be to say, say no, no, we need practical uh, pro bono support for those people to straight away know that they're facing SLAP and they can actually protect themselves uh, with those lawyers. So this is a bit where we are, I mean, th those proposals at the, the open level um, are just, you know, live at the moment. No idea if it will turn into something, but uh, it was just to share with you um, sort of the journey we slap uh, from something that was much more of an academic concept 20 years ago to something that has become extremely tangible in terms of anyone that does bring those cases. I, sorry, I know that I'm going a little bit over time, so I'm going to just conclude by Telling you, if you're interested by this, I just put some links there and I will share the slide uh, with uh, Dr. Grasso that you will have access to. There's so much training and so much happening at the moment. So, you know, as I said, it was more like a, an introduction rather than something really in depth on the topic. So I invite you to read more on this. Um, there's also a lot of webinar demand because, you know, with the pandemic at the moment, it's easier to attend webinars. So I invite you as well to uh, see some of those webinars. Uh, but on this note, I'm gonna turn to Costa and maybe to move to more um, a sharing panel. But thanks for your attention. 
Jeremy, thank you so much. It was a brilliant presentation. It's, a, it's an extremely uh, topical issue. And uh, it's also quite uh, very current. So thank you very much for that. So I will uh, start a bit the panel discussion and then we will uh, stop the recording and give the floor to several questions that we have already here. I have three points to, to I would like to have your perspective on. The first one is, as you said, it's not a new thing. Uh, we have experienced that in United Kingdom already in the 1990s, the, the, the most famous case is the McLibel case, uh, where McDonald tried to suppress uh, public participation against uh, London Greenpeace, uh, using and uh, abusing, let me say, abusing the defamation law in the United Kingdom. On that occasion, it was a big drawback, because even if they won the case, for the company was a great, a big reputational damage, because they, they were... Uh, it demonstrated to everybody the balance of forces of a huge corporation against two, the only two activists that decided to resist, where all the media companies and all the other activists decided to, to say sorry. And uh, why this is not happening again? Why they are using again and again all these um, tactics, but we didn't uh, uh, have a new McLibel case around what's happening are they point uh, are they just aiming to uh maybe some jurisdiction as you said where the rule of law is weaker but you of course said that is happening also in the united states so what is what does change why we are not uh, is the problem of the civil society i mean this is the first point the second point is that the balance of forces. So about what we, remedies that we can implement. For sure, we have to adopt anti-slap legislation because we are exposed right now. Our legal system is not ready to face this challenge. Um, William Bourdon, uh, in, in, the, in the meeting that we had uh, in the last seminar said that uh, he was speaking with some people in the banks and they said, we don't mind that there is a law that is against the, us for doing it, that is protecting whistleblower. We will hire and pay the best lawyers so that we will you know, go on with this lawsuit for years because our aim is not to win the case, it's to deter the others to speak up. So we, we need to intervene. This is for sure. So my point here is, is that I like the proposal you, you, you said, uh, you spoke about, but I think that we have to go a bit further with punishment. Of course, when uh, the, the slap nature the strategic nature of the defamation suit or the other lawsuit is ascertained by the judge when there is no doubt that it was a strategic lawsuit, of course, it not, was not a, a sincere defamation lawsuit. And also in terms of compensation, because this is, was for the entire uh, seminar important, how we can compensate the activists that are under fire. Uh, and we knew that, for example, whistleblowers in the US have awards uh, millions has been awarded in Europe. We are reluctant. We say let's give them let's give, give them compensation. But actually, compensation in the EU is quite low. So even if they give you, I don't know, twenty thousand uh, pounds, thirty thousand pounds for compensating, or oh, this is not enough. So what do you think about the this? Let's call it compensation, not awarding. But this compensation should be American style one. 1 million. So if you do this against an activist and you are doing that in this way, we will compensate this guy with an American high level compensation style to, in a way, rebalance this uh, unbalance of forces. The third thing is that nobody's speaking about something. We are lawyers. I mean, they cannot do this without lawyers. This strategic lawsuit have to be conceived by, by lawyers. And this is, of course, unethical. So do you think that we have to act to intervene uh, with disciplinary measures when it's clear that lawyers help a, a corporation to create a strategic lawsuit that has been ascertained as strategic by a judge? So when this is done, then their lawyers should be also excluded from the bar because they are unethical people that are abusing the legal system and this against what the lawyers should do. We shouldn't do that and we are lawyers. So these are my three points uh, and I would like to start with this and then I will give the, the floor to my colleagues. Well, 
I wish you would be in charge of the next legislation on this. <laughs> you will really get this sorted. Uh, you can imagine we, in terms of politics and the real politics on this, we are miles, miles, and miles away from any of thing like this. That's why I, you know, I, I was careful on when I said these are proposals by some of the brave members of parliament of you know the European Union, which, let's be honest, they don't have a, a lot of political you know power. Um, so. You know, there's no real political will yet. Uh, and again, why? You know, I don't want to get into uh, some crazy theories, but you know, we, we kind of know why. You know, um, we have to be realistic about the law. It, it's there to protect uh, corporate interest, and especially when it comes about corporate interests that are involving foreign investments. So I think there's no, you know, countries are going to be extremely mindful and careful before they pass any anti slap legislation about the potential impact on their trade. Uh, and sadly, that's, you know, this is the reality when it comes to even, you know, the larger picture of human rights. <laughs> so I think there's a, I think it's for civil society and people involved to really push, you know, uh, those parliaments to wake up because it has to come more for parliament rather than the executive, I think. In terms of the compensation, uh, you know, at this stage, I think many of the victims themselves would be just be happy to be put out of the hook very quickly. And if they've been told, you know, you're not going to face jail and you're not going to be bankrupted for the rest of your life because you had a case against you by a corporation. The fact that they may get something in return will be great. But I mean, at this stage, I think for them, it's just, please tell me that my life is not over. Because, you know, this is the kind of situation they're facing. Uh, they have to be really brave to take those cases, you know. Uh, so I think it's, I will agree with you, but sadly, in terms of reality check, we are we are quite far. And going back maybe to where you started, it seems like since the Mac Libel case in the US, uh, you know, that was such an endemic, important case, we should have learned. But it feels like not much. It actually gone the opposite. It actually probably created the strategy in many minds of some of the lawyers saying, "Wow, that's clever. Why don't we do that?" So um, it's the opposite. And again, I'm, maybe I don't share with you the ethical <laughs> corporate uh, lawyers firm because I think you know many lawyers it's I wish they could be more controlled by uh, the, the bar association and uh, the legal association but I mean it doesn't work like this it's uh, I think many of the lawyers and I've seen them in those cases they if you read between the line what they felt they felt it's normal it's their job they are just doing what a lawyer should do which is you have got a client and they feel they been tarnished and their, their reputation has been tarnished and so they go to court so is it unethical i think the four maybe all of us sitting in this room <laughs> will feel that way but uh it might be really hard to get any of those legal association or bar association at the national level to the example but I'm, I'm i'm not saying it no i'm saying it could be adding to the list of things we could add on to deal with slap uh, but it might be challenging um and again we have to remember what you know going back to what you said you know the elephant in the room which is the the imbalance of power in terms of paying uh they're gonna get the best lawyers all the time <laughs> you know they're gonna get uh, the lawyers that are able to drag on those cases in many different directions and are these lawyers gonna be scared by any sort of an ethical process i i seriously doubt it uh, so i think we need some odds agreement between states and that's why i have a bit more belief maybe in a european union led approach because it's, if it's a one state solution it's never going to quite work and uh, and you know big federal state like the us you know or canada will they do it at the federal level i doubt it because again they'd be afraid of the trade impacts or the you know what will be the message given so i'm not saying it's impossible but like any of those things we we need a much more the political system is not yet ready and it's 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 a kind of a non-seen big issue for many government if you talk about it they're like oh, okay it's a small it's they don't see it as a big deal yet so we might need suddenly another mac back label case like one of those big emblematic case to maybe bring back the attention to say it is quite serious so and by the way we got close to this the fact that the open union is moving is um i don't know if you remember in malta you know that woman that was shot and killed and that we still you know it's a mysterious disparation uh that's what started the open parliament to look at this because some of the journalists that reported on our deaths uh, basically were started to have litigation against them 
And then that's one of the MP realized. And if you look at the name, I put Penia from Malta for that reason. So you see what I mean? We need, as usual with legal change, you need sadly a terrible case to start the realization of the politician that this is actually something much more endemic. So yeah, sorry, yeah, because I, I share with you the fact that I would like to have more punishment and more control, but. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, yes, I agree with everything you said. We have to start maybe to start uh, to raise awareness among colleagues then. Uh, so ethical trainings, if not public uh, punishment, so they, they will understand what they, what they shouldn't do. <laughs> but I agree with every, everything you said. So Don, please, would you like to, to ask uh, some question to Jeremy? Well, I feel a little isolated from this because I'm not an attorney, um, but listening to this dialogue back and forth, I think Jeremy had a, um, an interesting perspective, um, and I tend to agree that those lawyers that are initiating these suits may very well um, see it as their duty uh, in representing their clients to do so. So I, I agree also with you in terms of needing ethical training, but I'm really kind of interested in this idea that um, Jeremy put forth about creating perhaps, I, I don't know that he suggested it structured this way, but perhaps maybe an NGO of um, pro bono counsel to um, provide a resource for those um, who need this type of specialized um, representation. What do you think? No, absolutely. And I think this is part of starting to call the, I think it's part of what we're trying to do, which is to show that SLAP is not, because I think people feel very isolated when a case like this starts. They don't realize that uh, we can connect the dots between all those cases. Um, so I think it's, it's about that. It's trying to show, look, there's a narrative there that is not a unique case because every case is unique, but actually they are formed the same. So I think this is what would be great actually to have this kind of um, maybe some humorous lawyer that really start to pick this and say okay we're going to be there in for those cases because i said these are actually so technical cases that it's actually quite hard to be specialized in any defamation case in most of the world but there are lawyers like this so probably it would be an idea to get them to start something <laughs> so our, i guess my my last question would be are you um hopeful or pessimistic about the United Nations engagement on these issues? It's a bit odd because, you know, I think the event goes by, uh, you know, it's like this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. This idea of having a, even a human rights treaty has been there, you know, even before I started to even be interested by law um, 20 years ago, it was already in the pipeline. We went through a um, very progressive to total dismantle of the idea. Now we're back again into a more hopeful situation, then we're probably going to go down again. So it's a, uh, this is the point of the UN. It's, you know, as you know, you know, you're based in the US, it takes a new administration in the US or a Chinese delegate, you know, it's, those process can be stored very quickly. So I, I think it's important for discussion and uh, raise the awareness and make it much more public to have the UN really sort of involved, but Probably the legal change will have to come from like more, you know, federal states or litigation or European Union-led initiative. Because the UN sadly, apart from um, probably making a bit noise, a bit more noise, and they should make more noise on this. Um, but the kind of changes we're talking about, you know, as Costa said, there being more proper like compensation, proper stopping of this. I don't. And don't get me wrong, I'm someone that really firmly support the UN. I think that it's good we have them, even though it's frustrating. But yeah. Yeah, I don't really have much hope on that front, to, to be honest with you. <laughs> I think we have to push more like what you describe, having maybe lawyers to get involved, having some sort of a more like politician at the national level. I saw there was a question from one of the participants from Lola on the, you know, maybe the change of administration in the US, could that support that? Again, if it's connected to climate change, it's something the administration support, we could see, you know, I think it's maybe a bit strategic there to pick some of the political momentum, to pick one case to show, look, this is actually a real issue. It's not only a one-off, uh, but then, you know, this is the problem. Politicians uh, don't stay always there. They don't have the time, then the Congress might not be in the same. So, if, you know, so it's hard to say. Uh, sadly, what I really feel, it's there are going to be so many of those cases because of climate change and the uh, degradation of the environment. Because whenever we're going to take uh, a case against an uh, oil company or any of those companies that basically trying to say that they are doing green recovery and green transition, 
the company going to take defamation cases straight away against the people saying, no, this is not real. You're not doing that. You're actually still exploiting the oil. They will just say defamation. So that's where maybe where slap is going to become so bad that they will have to need intervention to protect people that can, can we actually talk about the environment, about climate change without facing like a litigation against us? Because it, it might get to do <laughs> Well, we now, I don't know if you noticed. Oh, it is. I see Lola's question. Uh, thanks, Lola. That's uh, very in, insightful. Um, so all hopes on John Kerry and the ear of the new president. Thank you. So uh, let's, let me give the floor to Luca. Luca. Thank you, Costa. So uh, let me, first of all, uh, thank you, Jeremy, for this uh, uh, presentation. I, I would like to discuss with you about a couple of cases um, that we had in France. Uh, the first is a typical slap case um, against uh, a colleague, actually, um, who was... Um, who was uh, actually prosecuted uh, for defamation for having uh, uh, just, I mean, for doing uh, his job. Uh, he wrote an article uh, about uh, a commentary of uh, a decision concerning uh, uh, the condemnation of a corporation for environmental offenses, and it was, and he was attacked by the, by this corporation for this uh, article. So um, I wonder if you know other cases involving, other ZLAP cases involving uh, academics. And if you think that academics might be considered uh, as human rights defenders or human rights watchdogs. And another, uh, other cases, I mean, uh, they are not properly uh, ZLAP cases because they uh, concern um, human rights and environmental uh, activists who are uh, prosecuted for offenses against property. So I, I think about the, the chair cases. Uh, um, uh, I mean, it's a case that some activists, uh, uh, concerning the action that some activists led against uh, BNP Paribas, they stole the chairs to denounce the involvement of uh, BNP Paribas in the financing of fossil uh, corporations. Um, and then other cases uh, um, uh, involving uh, always um, also um, environmental activists who stolen um, the uh, president uh, of the public portraits. Um, so in both cases, they uh, argued for uh, the state of necessity. And in some cases, uh, judges uh, recognize this deference. In other cases, uh, public prosecutors decided not to proceed. So my question is about, um, so I have two questions. The first question is, is the role that public prosecutors might um, have in slap um, litigations. Um, I mean, especially in countries where the action is, um, is not uh, mandatory, they can uh, effect, I mean, they can uh, decide not to proceed. And the second question is about state of necessity. What do you think about uh, this tool, uh, if it can be properly uh, used in slap litigations? Great point, Luca. Thanks. Um, maybe the easiest one first. Academics being a target? Yes, sadly, absolutely. Uh, I should have said in Thailand, there's um, if I remember on top of my head, at least four academics that have been put into the dock, just because for the fact that they were using term, uh, you know, they said that maybe it was slavery and then suddenly that's it. The corporation will just attack them and put them into the back. So it's not unusual. I think it won't be more and more the case. And again, if we go back to what we said, environmental cases, climate change, you can imagine some of the academics are going to be put into a, a, the target of the corporation. Um, in terms of the cases, because it's interesting the way, you know, I, I know about the, the one, the BNP and the chair, uh, you know, it's, it's just an amazing case, but there's so many, uh, actually the more I was waiting for today, just to be a bit more to speed with the cases, it's endless. You know, you pick a country, it starts to, because uh, you start to realize, oh, but this is slap, this is slap. I think it's just the way we frame it. And then the more you realize what it means is if it's a, 
the litigation that was taken by a corporation, they knew they would never win, but they wanted to do it to, to stop public participation. You start to realize there's actually much more than we imagine. Uh, and I was struck by this that there's no, um, and so I don't know if there are some PhD uh, students listening or some LLM master students that are looking for a project for a PhD. I think there's a good one there. It's uh, <laughs> to do actually to start the process of uh, collecting this, you know, uh, actually starting to collect all those cases because they, they feel like those cases that they are isolated. They don't, we don't make the connection. We don't realize that sometimes it's the same lawyer. <laughs> It's the same legal firm doing those cases because they become quite specialized. So there might be a little uh, pet project for someone there to uh, just to actually start to put the dots together and say, yes, these are slap litigation. They're not just BNP or they're just not that case. It just they are connected. Um, and I have to say, actually going back to this on anyone interested, research is needed on both the content, but also the what we mean by this lab so yeah anyone <laughs> happy to do a phd <laughs> please <laughs> go for it <laughs> um on the public prosecutor yeah that would be again and this is what i really felt when uh, you know this idea that is put by the council of europe which is very early dismissal would be that it's a public prosecutor could straight away say uh, i'm sorry i'm not even going to prosecute because mm -hmm. I can see that you know you can you know you can feel it from the start that it, the corporation is not serious. It's not based on any proper evidence. It's just based on you know purely noise. If the prosecutor could straight away say, "I'm not even going to register the case," sorry, that would be the end of it. Um, so I think there's a question of where in countries where we have public prosecutors that have this power, like in France, that might work. But yeah, many countries where it's not the case. You know, it's uh, more like uh, the balance of the lawyers. So this is what would be interesting to actually create those laws that a not only tell the public prosecutor you have the power to do that, but also tell the court itself if there's no public prosecution, you also have the power straight away to like the public. Prosecutor. You won't even actually charge for defamation because there's nothing in it. It's shallow. So maybe some administrative, you know, some graph in the court or. But I think that's something that the, the lawmaker would have to think about. What would be the straight mechanism that will avoid even starting to have a judge involved? Because then that's it. If you have the judge involved, we are in this slow process of litigation that costs money. So there, there should be a, something like, yeah, the prosecutor office or some, you know, some, some form of administrative oversight that can just say straight away, this is dismissed. Yeah. Um, Thank you. In terms of the state of necessity, yeah, that's not surprising. Um, that could work again. Sorry, I'm kicking in touch, but again, is there anyone that wants to do research on this? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I that stuff for me, it's I, I wasn't even I didn't even use the word slap before I started to uh, look at the case, and that was in Tanzania when I started to realize, wow, they are. like the people involved that I was working with were starting to be attacked on different level. And then the journalist and I realized, wow. And then I just picked that thread and realized, wow, this is something called slap. But there's actually not very um, much advanced thinking on, okay, can, what would be the difference? Can we use necessity? Should they, maybe this group of lawyers that Don was talking about, if they start to join, this is the way to think about what will be the first sort of defense you can put straight away to try to dismiss those cases. That is necessity. We have to bring those informations to on straight away that it can't be defamation because Basically, otherwise, the climate is going to go so bad that the, we won't be able to do anything. If we waste five years in court to stop an oil company for defamation on what they're doing, then five years is too long in terms of climate change. So I think that's why we, this is why we, we need some clever legal strategy to fast to fast track those cases. Because, you know, there are issues that, yeah, like climate change is one. We don't have the time to uh, waste five years or 10 years in litigation. So yeah, again, sorry, I don't, you know, I said, uh, I don't have answers to many of things. It's because it's something that really is striking when you think about it as a strategy, but it's hard to say it like this because it's, it feels more like corporation react to something. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. So we will now stop the recording. So let me say formally thank you to Jeremy. Thank you, uh, Luca. Thank you, Don. That was our last seminar. It was great to have you here. Uh, and uh, thank you for all your support. Now we stop the recording.